Yes, Rob. Is this one on? Do I have to, do I have to turn it on? All right, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the Baron Forness Library uh, here at Edinburgh University. Uh, we appreciate everyone coming, whether you're from the community, whether you're a student, or just interested in our topic. Um, the title of tonight's uh, event is called um, Transgender Language. It's part of our Uncomfortable Conversation series, uh, which we brought about to campus to you know, discuss things that, just like the name says, are, can be uncomfortable to new audiences. We bring a, a, a civil forum here so we can ask questions, talk to experts and panelists, and basically just share in a dialogue about um, interesting uh, current topics. Um, so for today, uh, transgender people come from many different ways of life, from many different backgrounds, uh, and sometimes it's difficult to tell if someone is transgender just by looking. Um, we're hosting this uh, discussion to talk about transgender language uh, and identity, and to also learn what it really means to be a transgender ally. So we have uh, our three panelists on the stage right now, just brief introductions, we have Dr. Uh, Elaine Rinfret. Um, she is the chairperson of the social work department here. Uh, we have uh, Michelle Wolf, um, a male to female transgender woman, a ma uh, marriage and family therapist in Erie, and who has been working with transgender clients for, for many years as a therapist. And then we have uh, Dr. Roger Wolbert from the Math and Computer Science Department, um, who is the chairperson of Edinburgh University's LGBTQIA Commission. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wolber, who's going to give a little uh, introduction to the commission, and we're going to start the conversation from there. We will each, uh, we'll give the panelists each a, a couple minutes to talk about uh, their backgrounds and also um, their topic that they brought to the table tonight. And then afterwards, we're going to open up to questions. So any question that you might have um, about uh, transgender language, being an ally, anything that you would like to discuss tonight, um, please don't hesitate to ask. So I will turn it over to our panelists. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. And um, it's nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces. So I hope you uh, find the evening enjoyable. I am part of one of the three commissions here at the university. They are presidential commissions on the status of um, one is diversity, one is on women, and one is LGBTQIA uh, people. So um, if you'd like to be involved in one of those three commissions, feel free to. Um, you can submit your name to Terrence Mitchell. He is in our um, equity office. Um, he'll also be sending an email out to students, so I encourage you, if you're interested in, in uh, one of those commissions, to be part of that. Our commission takes a look at the policies um, at our university towards LGBTQIA people and also um, at the state level. We also are currently working on um, getting a uh, guest speaker next year to come in to talk about how um, issues related to our commission might tie into the Jewish traditions. And um, we also are working on things like the preferred name policy here at Edinburgh and also here in Pennsylvania, as well as some other issues. So just keep your eye out for other types of ways of getting involved, perhaps with one of our commissions. Now I'd like to let um, Dr. Rinfret uh, okay. introduce herself. Thank you. Um, so um, hopefully, can you hear me? All right. So uh, my name is Elaine Rinfred, and I'm the um, chair of the social work department, and I'm also on the LGBTQIA um, commission. We um, were supposed to have two speakers tonight, um, but unfortunately, um, Tyler Titus um, had a death in his family just a, about an hour ago, um, so he's not able to attend. And um, I asked Dr. Wolbert if he would help out um, with uh, being a, a speaker and just seeing what he and I can offer if questions come up, um, because we're not the experts, but um, we uh, um, are willing to try to help out. So the um, reason that, that we um, have this topic um, is that we think it's pretty timely. Um, at least in my world, uh, I am more and more introduced to people um, who are transgender, um, and I hear more about the um, people who are in that process. So I also hear about a lot of misunderstanding about it. So I thought it would be a good um, topic to introduce to the Uncomfortable Conversations Forum and see if um, that would be a topic they were interested in, and fortunately they were. So, um, uh, um, Tyler, um, 
hepatitis is pretty well known to a lot of people here in um, Western Pennsylvania um, for his activism around transgender issues. And um, it's unfortunate that he couldn't come, but I don't think we'll um, be um, less uh, informed um, by Michelle Wolf, who has um, done this sort of presentation numerous times and has a lot of information to offer and um, is um, very what brave about answering questions and very you know forthcoming. So um, I think you'll be pleased at what she um, offers you tonight. So without any further ado, I'll introduce uh, Michelle Wolf. Hi. In case you haven't gathered, I'm Michelle Wolf. Can everybody <laughs> first of all can everybody hear me? Okay, because I'm not hearing like the reverb from the mic, so I'm just guessing here. If anybody can't hear me in the back, just raise your hand and I'll assume to speak louder. So anyway, I'm here to make you all feel uncomfortable tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad to hear people laughing because what I really want to do is take the discomfort out of the conversation. Um, there's a lot of, a lot has changed in the past 10 years, right? 10 years ago when I first started even thinking about transitioning, it was a very different time than now. And I'm very happy to see a lot of young faces here because many of you grew up in a time when things have been evolving and changing and it's wonderful. And one of the things I worry about, however, is that there's almost a stigma now about talking about transgender and transgender topics. What's the correct, you know, what's the correct language to use? When I introduce myself, should I use, you know, here's my preferred pronouns? I hear a lot of that going a lot around now. Uh, people identify them, <coughs> identify themselves by their gender identity and their gender understanding. And again, I think that's really freaking awesome. Uh, however, much of the rest of the world, as you probably know, just hasn't necessarily caught up to that. So there's going to be a long time of transition right now. And I thought speaking about that in between time might be, I don't know, something that we might touch on tonight. Anyway, just to give you a little bit of background myself, uh, Lane did a super job. Um, my name is Michelle Wolf. As I said, I'm used to saying that in my introduction, so bear my repeating. Um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, ground rules. Number one, there are none. You can ask me any question you want. Um, I've done this type of presentation many, 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 many times in the past. I teach a one, trans one one seminar. Every once in a while, there's some Weisenheimer in the, off, in the audience who wants to try to get a zinger in. I will literally answer anything you ask me. It's all OK. It's all cool. Don't worry about it. I, I'm looking out at you, and I'm seeing some faces like, yeah, I don't really believe her. But it's OK. You'll try me, and it'll work out well. Because what I really want to do is have the rest of you walk, is have everybody here walk out of here and not feel like I was lectured at by a transgender person, but to have you walk out of here and say, like, yeah, I know a transgender person. She told me, you know, this is cool about this language or this is okay about this topic and get a real understanding of things. Like, I want you to feel that you know me. Um, all right, I'm not going to go on too long. I usually give a whole spiel about my transition and that. If anybody has any questions, happy to answer. But for right now, uh, just to give you background, I transitioned about, oh, I started my transition formally about eight years ago. Um, and unlike some, as many of you know, trans people don't necessarily have a set, you know, set of steps that they necessarily complete. Some people, get hormones, some people don't. Some people formally change their name, some don't. Some have, some want to. There's a whole lot of variation in there. Some people get surgery, some people don't. So there's no assumptions to be made here, but I'll be perfectly open. I got my, sur I, I went all the way. I had my surgery done in 2013, never looked back, and I've been doing these presentations now since about that time just to open up awareness. So um, that being said, what I'd really like to do is open up the floor to some questions, because I'm sure many of you have some. And again, I really want to put it out there. There is no question off topic. And if I know you and nobody's answering questions, I might pick on you. <laughs> yeah, see you in the back. Does it, do we have a microphone that can float yeah. around? Or, thank you. Hi, my name's Maddie. I'm the president of the Speech and Hearing Club, and we actually have a lot of members here tonight. So I was just curious if you went um, to a speech language pathologist to change your voice. That, um, go ahead. 
<laughs> That's a great question, you know. Um, in my transition journey, um, early on, my, uh, I'm married and my wife, you know, would say to me often in restaurants and such, usually like, you're using your male voice again. And I would get embarrassed and I would try to go a little bit higher and then I sound like Minnie Mouse. And so I eventually went to, there was a free thing going on in Fredonia. I was living in Buffalo at the time. So I'd drive down there every Wednesday and she'd work with me. And I gotta be honest with you, she got very, very frustrated. Because honestly, like when I remembered to change my voice, I would do it. When I didn't remember, I would just go back to male voice. And so honestly, I, I still keep doing that, and a point a time, a point in time came a few years ago when I just said, "This is my voice. I'm just going to live with it." So it's a great question. It's something that maybe in the future I might think about working on, um, but I probably won't because I'm lazy. <laughs> Good question. Yes. Um, so I'm going to be an elementary school teacher. Oh, and wonderful. So I was just wondering if you have a student that's transgendered in elementary school, what would be the best way to approach that, especially in like a rural area, thinking about like the other families too and wanting to keep that student safe? You know, that's a really, that's an excellent question, and it's a tough one, too, because we're covering a lot of different things, right? Um, I don't know what the policy is at your school. Or, or I guess the first question I want to ask is, does the school have a policy at all in place to be affirming to trans students, or are you kind of in the, oh, crap, what do we do now? <laughs> um, it's just hypothetical, but I'm oh, okay. sure that... At least in the areas that I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sure they don't have a policy in place. I'm guessing probably in a rural area, that's probably true. And I'm not going to lie to you, it's going to be tough because you're going to have, you're going to have, it's really going to come down to the parents in a lot of cases. The school might set a policy and say, you know what, we're going to be affirming, we're going to support this kid, you know, you were, your name was, you know, Marzipan and now it's Lollipop, that's great, we're going to call you Lollipop. I'm just making up names here. Um, <laughs> And we're gonna let you use the boys' room or the girls' room, whatever gender they're transitioning to. But what you're gonna end up seeing is that some parents in the school dress will say, like, yeah, I know about this. I, I saw Michelle's presentation, so I know about this now. It's cool, you know, support Lollipop. But there'll be other parents who come and say, like, this is wrong, this is unnatural, this is a big problem. And it's gonna be it's gonna be difficult on an administrative level. You as a teacher, however, um, can make a huge difference. It can make a huge difference because, number one, you can affirm the child's identity by calling them the name they identify as. And that, that alone is it's enormous. It's huge because in trying to make that transition, the number, I'd say, look, one of the biggest worries that trans people have is that people aren't going to believe them. People aren't going to think it's real. People are going to disrespect the fact that they're making this journey, which is really, really hard. And for a child to do it, it's incredibly brave. Um, so you as a teacher, if you support the name, if you support the gender pronouns, um, you're already making a big difference. If you feel like going above and beyond and really fighting the good fight and working with the administration, trying to educate the parents, bringing a speaker, I'm, I'm for hire, um, <laughs> and doing things like that, it can, um, it can really mean the difference between the child having a very great and affirmative learning experience where they can actually concentrate on, on horrible things like fractions or or just have a miserable, miserable time and be driven off in the corner and, you know. You need to sit next to a math teacher. <laughs> they were Do you want to trade? Yeah. <laughs> I taught them fractions. <laughs> Very good. Okay. I forgive you. <laughs> so, yes, wonderful, great question. Thank you. Did that answer your question? It did. Okay. If I don't answer your question, because sometimes I meander a bit, please always say, like, that's great, Michelle, but, like, get to the freaking point already, okay? <laughs> it's okay to do that. Hi, yeah. I'm Zayla. Uh, I actually have two questions. Sure. Um, they're kind of tough ones. The first is um, I've gotten into debates about peop with people about, you know, the trans issue and whether or not the increase in the amount of people coming out as trans and trying to transition, you know, is a trend. Um, you know, it's part of the gay agenda, if you will. Right. Um, what would your response right. to that be? You know, that's a tough question because people do. They come out and they say, well, look at the numbers. You know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, the trans population was like one out of 40,000, and now we're down to like one out of 100. What gives? Was something in the water? Is this a trend? Are people just adopting this, you know, huge life-changing 
pardon my language, pain in the ass transition just to, you know, gain some type of notoriety in that. Um, what I always point people to is that people don't just, it's not like, let me give you an example. If anybody's ever watched the show The Office, the character Michael, one time, somebody recommended that he declare bankruptcy. And so he walked out into the middle of the floor and he said, I declare bankruptcy. And of course, it did nothing. And the same thing goes with the trans population. Nobody just walks out into the middle of the room and says, I am trans. There's a lot involved and it's really hard stuff. I would say that the transition pro process is difficult enough that Nobody does it unless they really have to. I imagine, yes, there probably are people out there who are so dedicated to their acting craft or whatever that they'll, they'll go through the whole thing. Um, I can't really understand. I personally can't understand that because all of it is really hard. Um, the steps of transition are painful, uh, difficult, often not covered by insurance. And people who do transition are often faced with a great deal of personal discomfort and awkwardness in their everyday life. It's explaining things to your parents. It's trying to get people to call you by a different name or pronoun than they might have in the past. And it makes it, you know, every day is a struggle, especially in the beginning. It's very, very hard. So when I look at the increasing trend of numbers, what I look at it and see is that people are starting to feel more comfortable than they did before. People are starting to feel a little bit safer, at least, in society today where they can say who they are, go to the grocery store, and hope to come back alive. You know, um, I'll be honest, when I first transitioned eight years ago, things were a little bit different, and I worried every time I went out, every time everything was new. You know, I went to the grocery store the first time. What's it going to be like? Are people going to laugh at me? You can see I'm a pretty outgoing person. I don't really scare very easy, but it was still very emotionally difficult at the time. Then going in the hardware store the first time. Oh, my God. I used to go there all the time as male. And they knew me. And then I had to go in there and like, you know, can you help me find a hammer? You know, it was very uh, it was very strange. It was embarrassing. I was swagging through like big layers of makeup because I didn't know how to do it back then. Um, so every bit of it was like intensely awkward, difficult, and painful. So again, I just I want to come back with nobody does this unless they absolutely have to. Um, what was the second question? Um, or first of all, did I answer your first one? You did okay. absolutely. And um, just going along with that, like the idea that you know I've also heard along those lines, other people, you know, other countries don't have um, the trans population that we have. And would you, you know, along those same lines, it's attributed to the acceptance like, I here think, in America. Yeah, I think it's accept I think it's really two things. Number one, um, things have things have changed here. Uh, things have things have substantially changed here. The idea of transgender has made it into the public arena. I mean I went through probably thirty years of my life. I never heard the word. I didn't know that anybody did this. I you know, walked around thinking that there was something wrong with me. I've heard of like these trannies or these transvestites and whatnot, and, but I didn't know what it meant and I didn't know how it applied to me. Um, and I didn't feel like it looked like some, uh, like drag queens in that day. I'm like, no, that's, that's not me. It doesn't feel right. Now things are very different. We're living in information age with the internet. There's a lot more information to be had. And I think like back when I was a kid, if I could have gone online and seen like, oh, wow, there's a whole community of people who feel the same way I do. Maybe I would have felt a little more emboldened. Maybe I would have felt a little bit more courageous to step out of my comfort zone. And I think in other countries, some of that freedom isn't there yet. Thank you. And my last question um, is, I guess, along the lines of how difficult it is to transition. Um, another argument that I've heard is that the suicide rate among people who have transitioned is much higher than those who have not. I don't know if that's true. That's just an argument that I've heard. What would you say to that? That's a great question. And though, honestly, those numbers are really hard to come by. And here's why. Um, Suicide is a huge problem in the transgender population. Huge, enormous. I think we have one of the highest suicide, if not the highest suicide rates of any pop, any demographic population out there. And so a lot of people look at the, and there's, is anybody who's ever done any stats? No, there's a lot of different ways to dice the numbers, right? We're just going to look at this sack versus this. For people who have not yet transitioned but committed suicide, there's no way of getting numbers unless somebody specifically wrote in their note um, hey, I'm transgender, but I can't take it, so, you know, and I'm not making light of the note, I'm just trying to simplify it, versus those who have transitioned 
and then taking their own life. What I'm personally seeing is that um, trying to, for a lot of people I work with, trying to exist in a skin that doesn't feel right is enormously uncomfortable. Um, the idea of making a change is also enormously frightening and anxiety provoking. So I think a lot of people who do go down, unfortunately go down that road, um, will commit suicide, um, probably with the thought that like, at least now nobody will ever know. And honestly, I had those thoughts myself. I was never, I never really had self-harm thoughts myself. I never went in that direction. I'm very fortunate. However, there were times where after, you know, is when I was younger, where I would get rid of all my clothing or anything associated with my female identity, and I would have that thought, like if I get hit by a car today, nobody will have ever known. And that it was so comforting, it felt so good. And I think that happens to the pre-trans population. As opposed, and when you look at the people who've already transitioned and still commit suicide, uh, again, that speaks to how difficult the process really is. Um, it's not as simple as, and I, again, I think almost all of you know this. Most of the people you see on TV, you know, they're like, I'm trans. They get wheeled into an operating room, wheeled out, and they're, and they're gorgeous. And, of course, it, it doesn't work anything like that. Uh, most of us, including myself, you know, even through our best efforts, you know, we still look like our male self in a dress. You know, it's, um, the transition usually doesn't go as easy or smoothly as, as a lot of people um, expect it to. Um, there's other factors involved there too. The trans population has a very high comorbidity with other mental illnesses. Uh, whether how the two are related is still yet to be determined, but those are some reasons. Did I answer your question? You're very welcome. Um, I'm wondering, Michelle, if you could, um, if it piggybacks with um, that issue about suicide uh, or mental health issues. The issue of support, what kind of support the transgender person gets through, uh, before, during, and after the process, and what impact that has? That's a great question, Elaine. Um, let me speak to that briefly. When it, comes to especially, when it comes to trans people, especially younger ones, people who still have a parental relationship with their parents, they're not yet fully on their own adult set. The biggest predictor of survival for younger people who are transitioning is the support of their parents, particularly their mother. Those with strong parental support were way more likely to survive um, those years than those who don't. Uh, more adult trans people, family support, including parents, is again, a huge determining factor. Uh, social support, support of friends, again, huge, enormous support. Because the most uncomfortable thing about being trans is other people. Um, living on my own in like the closet, I could you know dress who I want and look how I want and all that, but it didn't matter. Uh, when things became difficult was actually going th both going through the process and then having to interface with the rest of the world, trying to plug into it as female. Sometimes it went very well, other times not so well. And the amount of support that I had going through that, I think really spoke to my success. I did not do this on my own. Yes, you and back. Okay, I have kind of two things. Go for it. Um, the first thing I want to ask about is your birth name. Yes. I have a friend who uses the term dead name for her former name when she transitioned from male to female. Uh -huh. Like, what kind of things were you dealing with when you transitioned from one name to another? Oh, what a huge pain. Um, <laughs> yeah, dead names now seems to be the preferred term that people talk about using their original name. I'm not skeevy about mine. It doesn't, bo it doesn't emotionally bother me to say, like, yep, my name was Michael. Uh, that was on my original birth certificate. Uh, so my mother named me. Um, when my mother accidentally still calls me like eight years later, it's a little bit annoying. But again, I understand, you know, because she did name me that. Um, but trying to go through the name change, it, it was a huge pile of uh, frustration and red tape. Because as you know, um, nobody just changes all their identity at once. It happens in stages. And going through that process, I had to go through, I, had to, I was living in Buffalo at the time, I had to go downtown like three times, petition a judge, get the name change. And that was just getting permission to change my name. Then I had to go to the DMV to convince them to change my name, get a letter from my therapist to change my gender marker. And then you don't really have an idea of how much your name is out there until you go and change it. 
And even this to this day, eight years later, even having changed states and changed names and all that, I'm still getting Michael Wolf mail. I'm still getting it. Um, and so it never really goes away. The dead name never really goes away. Did that answer your question? It does. Okay. And the second thing, can you kind of talk to us a little bit about the difference between when a person decides they're trans versus when they're gender fluid? Like, what's kind of the dividing line for that? Boy, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a really, really big question. Uh, I'm going to answer in very general terms because there's no easy answer there. Um, gender, as we understand it now, is a spectrum, right? And a spectrum encompasses one point to another. So on either end of the spectrum, you have I'm 100% fully no holds barred male. On the other end, same deal, female. And then there's this all this area in between. Um, by trans people, and by bi, I don't mean bisexual, I mean like by, um, by gen gender binary trans people are ones who go from one end and try to make it as far as they can to the other end. They can never, you know, and this is honestly, it's kind of an unpopular thing to say sometimes because a lot of trans people feel very strongly, I'm, I'm female, I'm fully female, I'm 100% woman. I don't see it that way myself. I see it in myself as trying to get as close as possible to that other end. But in truth, I will have always had a male childhood. I will have always been born with male parts. I will always have those, those pieces of me and I'll never be able to give birth. You know, and there's a lot of things, I'll never have a period, and there's a lot of different things I will never experience. And those are things I have to make my peace with. So for me, I'm always trying to get to that, that far end or as close as possible. Now, when you talk about people who are gender fluid, then there's all kinds of terms here. Some people consider themselves gender fluid, gender queer used to be in term. I don't know if it still is anymore. Um, some people refer to it as no gender, bi gender, all gender. Pan there's so many different terminologies out there that speak to that huge area in the middle where people might find their comfort level. So the difference between a trans gender person and somebody who would be described as something else, in truth, there is no real appreciable difference. We're all people who don't really feel comfortable with the gender we were assigned at birth. Um, some people end up very conspicuously at one end, other people more comfortable somewhere there in the middle. And, um, and so in reality, th there is no difference except for what we need to do in order to feel comfortable on our own skins. Did that answer? Cool. Yes. Hi. Hi. Both of the trans individuals that I've met were both gay before they came out as transgender. Uh -huh. And I understand that you have a wife. So can you explain that dynamic to us? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a little harder to explain than uh, it. Um, than a short answer. Um, I'll just give you a summary for that. Um, <laughs> as, as all of you know, gender and sexuality are two separate things, right? A person can be, you know, cisgender, transgender, uh, gender fluid, and still also be either gay, straight, bi, asexual. The two things are not, um, the two things are independent, right? So for some trans people, the issue gets real blurry. When, gen when a person's understanding of their own gender is, well, I'll say squishy, sometimes notions of sexuality get squishy too. And I'm only going to speak to myself here. Uh, when I was younger, um, I very much wanted to be, and forgive me for this term, normal. Um, I wanted to be normal because I didn't feel comfortable you know, letting my real self go out there. So I wanted to be a heterosexual male. And I never felt that. I never felt really male. And honestly, I never really felt, I never really had like a strong drive to go out there and date and whatnot. Um, I did meet my wife during a period where I was feeling, I was having, I guess like a regrouping resurgence of my, uh, of my, you know, I guess belief in my own malehood and was really trying. And we met and we fell in love and honestly, we, we still love each other. Um, she's still my favorite person. She's still, you know, the person I love more than anybody in the world. Um, 
as to how that plays out sexually, I'm going to not divulge our personal stuff in there, but um, but I will say that um, that my transition doesn't really speak to either of our sexualities, and it's something that we've had to kind of learn to, we've had to learn to deal with in our own way. Sorry, I know that seems a little, um, I said I'd answer any question, but I can't answer questions about other people. <laughs> Good? Yes. Uh, I think kind of just a quick question. Uh, we talked about support from uh, family and from your wife. Uh, what was your personal experience with support from your family and other peers? You know, that's a great question. Um, my family, it took a little bit of time for them to get used to it. Um, different members of my family supported me in different ways. Uh, first person I came out to was my cousin. Um, she was immensely supportive. She and I have been best friends since pretty much birth. And she was, you know, number one supporter, very protective. I came out to my biological sisters. Uh, one was, hey, that's great. The other one took a lot more time to get used to it. Uh, she didn't know how her kids were going to react to it, and there was a lot of worry there. Uh, my mother was immensely supportive, which honestly at the time, I didn't know if that was going to happen or not because I, I didn't really understand her feelings about the LGBT, LGBTQIA community, and um, I, I didn't really know how that was going to go. So overall, my family was supportive. However, I did feel it at times. There were funerals that came up that I was kind of quietly urged to, like, maybe you just sit this one out because, you know, and again, it was one of those things where I had to sit there and I'm like, all right, I could go to Uncle Paul's funeral, and but if I go, I'm really going to make it about me because all these people have never seen me as female before. So what do I do, right? What's the right thing to do? Go there, pay my respects? Do I go there, mail? I'm not going to do that. So some, some issues become very difficult, and it really comes down to areas of personal comfort and personal choice. And for me, um, having to make those choices was very difficult at times. Sometimes I didn't appreciate my family for putting me in that, and I thought, like, you know what, they should say, just come, you know, and, you know, screw them all. But they didn't, and I don't know. Um, there's no hard feelings left, but at the same time, you know, it still, still sung a little bit. Yes. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Nindy, and I had a question about being a good ally. Okay. How can we be supportive uh -huh. when some of our friends and family are not? Like, how can we still be a good ally and not cut those people out? That's a good question. Um, I want to clarify... Uh, I want to clarify that a little bit. I'm, from what I'm hearing from your question is you're saying like, all right, I want to be a good ally, but like my husband or my mom or my this or my that, you know, are pretty, you know, they're pretty down on the whole thing. You know, like, oh, you're talking to that Michelle again. Well, got a loser. You know, what's he up to? Um, it might not be so supportive. And at the end of the day, we can't really change. We can't really make up anybody's mind for them. Um, as an ally, the best thing you could really do is um, be yourself. Um, if you feel the need to challenge their behavior, those of us who really rely on allies, we think that's great. At the same time, um, I often urge people not to burn bridges because at the end of the day, I've seen a lot of people come around. Um, there's been a lot of instances where people will, you know, They'll, they'll call off family, they'll call off friends. Like, I'm not just talking about allies, but trans person themselves. They'll you know, say, well, you know what, you're not supporting me, go fly a kite, I don't wanna see you anymore. And that often feels like a very good thing to do. It often feels very freeing, it often feels like cutting ties. But at the same time, I also believe very strongly in giving people a chance to come around and support because I've seen it happen so many times. So in your case, what you're talking about is, hey, if I'm an ally, how can I have these other friends, family members who are, you know, who are being very down on this person? Best thing you could do is really continue talking them up, continue advocating. Sometimes it's not the 50th time you said it, it's the 51st. Um, 
I don't know if that's a long, it's a very comprehensive answer, but I always believe in, you know, looking towards the long game. Um, you'll never change a, a person's mind who is determined not to have a change in a moment, but in a year you can. Did that answer your question? Who's next? Um, hi, my name is Amber, and I'm, I'm actually covering this for the school newspaper, if, if you're okay with that. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering, what, what would you tell a person who's, who, whose confidence is changing in their identity, whether they're sure they're this way or not sure the next time? Or? Um, so if I understand your question right, you're asking, what would I tell somebody who's questioning themselves right now, and they're not really sure? Uh, the thing I would always tell people is take your time. There is no rush. There is absolutely no rush. There's no expiration date on transitioning. Um, some people feel, a lot of people who transition feel a great urge to move quickly. Life is passing me by. The world, you know, I've lost so much time already being who I am. In reality, I think the people who really take their time and go and like really respect their own feelings, respect their own uh, limits, expect their, respect their own judgment, and really take their time to decide this is how I'm really going to feel most comfortable, end up the happiest with their decision. Um, so number one, don't rush. And the second piece of advice I always give to people, um, especially those who I've seen in therapy before, are always don't do anything you don't absolutely have to. Um, there is no rule. There is no... In the trans community, there's a, uh, there's a saying that's been around for many years, and it's called trangier than now. And it speaks to when you get a group of people together, comparisons are always made, right? You know, like, hey, I got my letter for HIT. Oh, yeah, well, I'm getting the surgery. You know, there's always that one-upmanship that seems to happen. It's not all people. It's not even most, but it's some. And so it creates a culture where sometimes people come into it and think, the only way I'm valid is if I do this. I'm, I'm even more valid if I do that. And what I like to tell people is to ignore all that. Do those things only that you need to do in order to feel comfortable in your own skin. For some people, it's doing very little. It might be changing their name, changing their hairstyle. Maybe, maybe they do start wearing female clothes. Maybe they feel like changing their name. Maybe they feel a need to go on hormones. Maybe they don't. It's all okay. Only do those things that you need to to feel comfortable in your skin. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, co-occurring or comorbidity with other mental illness. Yes. Um, what would you say to someone who says that those who are like claiming to be trans or are in the wrong body um, are mentally ill and then by calling them by their preferred pronouns and being otherwise supportive, like they would say that that's enabling that mental illness? That's, you know what, that's a good question. It's one that continually comes up with people who, who do think that, who come and say like, you know what, up until, up until pretty recently, I could look in the DSM and say like, oh, look, there's your mental illness, you're sick in the hack. I think there's a lot of misunder, first of all, I think there's a great deal of misunderstanding about mental illness. Um, I, right now I'm, I'm working with the mentally ill population and I enjoy it greatly. Um, I've never seen anybody who suddenly decided that they were trans where they weren't because th there is no mental illness that really mimics the same thing. Um, Transgender has been has been studied, and so there's still a lot of work to be done to study. We don't know why we are the way we are. We just we don't. Uh, there's different theories out there. Uh, eventually, maybe there's an answer. If there is, I say great. It doesn't change anything for me. Um, I am who I am. Um, but in why, in the people who point to it as a mental illness and say we're enabling, um, enabling or treating someone respectfully does not change their understanding of their own gender. Treating them disrespectfully does not change their understanding of their own gender. Nothing that other person does is going to change that. You can, you know, ridicule and browbeat somebody to where they might say, all right, I'm not going to say this to you anymore, but that's all that they really change. Um, people who go through reparative therapy or conversion therapy um, come out of it and they might be, you know, say like, wow, I don't want to go through that again. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to try and walk the straight and narrow. The truth is that it doesn't really change the issue. And the issue doesn't really fall under the 
under the hallmarks of any other mental illness because it, it doesn't. It's the only, it's one of the only problems that people solve for themselves by just being themselves. And that doesn't really speak to um, the difficulties that other people who have diagnosable mental illness, illnesses really, really face. They can't just say like, oh, you know what, I'm just gonna be me. It's usually caught, being me is usually causing them way more problems in their life and that's why they're seeking help. Transgenders aren't like that. Um, if people didn't have a problem with it, there wouldn't be any problem. You're welcome. Hi, um, I noticed that in the just a short amount of time I've been listening to you here, uh, there seems to be a lot of shifting, kind of, you know, like uh, non-binary and or if, you know, there's a middle section, uh huh, and and so there's a lot of shifting. So I was curious what your thoughts are on hormone blockers in children. How young do you think that it's safe to start them on blockers, and then? Um, what, what could be the, the, the upside and the downside to that? Uh, those are tough questions. And I'm, go I'm gonna just say right out here, I'm not a medical doctor. <laughs> so I'm going strictly on things I've read in opinion. But um, honestly, I'm not qualified to answer that question to it with any authority. I could give you my opinion, if that'll be good enough. Qualified? What's that? No, these aren't medical doctors either. Um, however, here's my understanding. I'm going to speak to it from a therapeutic point of view because that's what I know. Uh, medically speaking, I, I can't speak authoritatively. However, um, for hormone blockers, um, that's been a difficult issue, right? For a long time, and I'm going to speak to the history of that. For a long time, there was a lot of... Um, a lot of worry about it. There was a lot of reticence on the medical community to do this because for a long time, there was a study floating out there that said 70% of people who declare themselves trans or gay change their minds by the time they hit adolescence. So everybody looked at that study and said like, wow, that's a huge risk. Why would we do anything? Why would we perform any intervention at that time? The study, however, has since been like enormous, it, it, the data in there was fabricated. Um, and the studies that have been done since then are kind of showing usually in cases where the kids end up showing that they uh, have consistency in what they're saying, insistency in which they are very clear, uh, consistency, insistency, and I always forget the third one. Um, do you remember? No. Okay. Well, there's a third one, <laughs> and I'm sorry I'll, if I remember it. But anyway, kids who are very clear about who they believe themselves to be who act accordingly, are willing to put up with, honestly, I don't think there's a trans kid out there who, you know, flew their own flag and didn't suffer a lot of ridicule and, blue, uh, and bullying, but still push forward. It's kind of, it's a strong marker that they are who they say they are. Um, in terms of puberty blockers, the dangers there, again, I'm not a medical doctor from what I understand, the, the risk there is fairly low because the puberty blockers can be, they could go off the puberty blockers at any time later and then undergo puberty. Um, there are there, there's probably some risks, so I don't know what they are though. Um, do I think it's a good idea? I think, there, if there's a, I think if there's a child out there who's really clear about who they are, willing to go forward and is brave enough to speak to their own identity and put up with the enormous difficulties in doing so, you know, I, I would, you know, my personal gut feeling is to give them a shot and, and believe them. Does that answer your question? I hear you. Okay. Hi. So Hi. I actually have two questions. Sure. Um, do you ever feel envious of people who are born with the gender that they identify with? That's a great question. You know, that's a really great question. In the beginning, when I first began to transition, I did have a lot of those feelings. I would look at other women and say, like, you know, you don't know how lucky you've got it. Um, I was looking at things very sunny side up, right? Because, you know, again, I'm going to say what well, might be an unpopular thing, but, like, I grew up a white male. I had it really easy. <laughs> I had it really, yes, I was shy. Yes, I was awkward. Yes, I didn't really fit in. But let's be honest, I had it, I had it pretty easy. 
And so I didn't look at the difficulties that growing a female might have presented me. And so it looked all sunshine and roses. And so I looked at it and said, like, aren't they lucky? They get to have, they get to have children. Uh, I'll never be able to do that. However, there's many women who, you know, for any number of reasons, um, again, won't enjoy those privileges of, uh, you know, there were air quotes there, uh, femalehood. So as I began to look at things more holistic, more on like a whole level, I looked and said, like, yes, you know, I, I had it luckier growing up. Have I, g given the choice, I would have been born female, but I wasn't. You know, I could sit and I could ruminate on that all day. I could kick the dirt. But at the end of the day, um, th this was my path. This is where I am. And so, you know, spending time with Envy did me, would do me no good. And so I was able to drop it. So would you say you have, you still have Envy or you've no, kind of gone past not, it? Not really so much anymore. I've kind of come to terms with um, who I was, who I've become, and it's really all the same person. But, um, but this is my story and this is my path. I don't know where I would have ended up. I, I, can't, I can't predict that but I'm happy with where I am now. Okay, um, my second question is, um, is there any hate within the transgender community about, I mean, like there's colorism and racism. Is there mm -hmm. hate like that in the transgender community as well? <sighs> That's a good question. Are you talking about, um, I, think you're, I think what you're talking about here is, you know, is there racism within the trans community? No? No, it's more like, Oh, um, you didn't really come out because you didn't do this, or uh, yes. you're not. You know what I mean? Something like that. There is. It seems to be a minority, but it, it was. Um, that's what I was talking about before with um, what we in the trans community called the trangier than now population. That population that seems to look at their transition or the transition of other people as a contest. There's no winging this contest. You know, you could do everything in the world and they could do nothing. Who's happier? Who knows? It, it depends on like what they need to do to live their life and whatnot. So yes, there, there are a lot of people um, who think along those lines and I think they're less happy for it. And again, just like every population in the world, whatever it is, any demographic, you know, there are trans people who are jerks, just the same as, as anybody else, right? There's, you know, all kinds of, all kinds. <laughs> By the way, the other term was persistent. Insistent, consistent, persistent. Persistent, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, so I work here, and I'm here with my team, and we oversee the Career Center. So we're working with students tr with career counseling and um, the whole room just turned around, so it's a little <laughs> overwhelming. So, hey, you're the um, one to see after. <laughs> we're working a lot with students on their career development. So I have a slightly different question. So we sure. know that workplace protections for bias and actions against trans people really depends on an interpretation of the Civil Rights Act. Correct. And that recently some of those um, interpretations were rolled back um, yes. by our last said maybe second to last attorney general. So my question to you is, for yourself personally, what your experience was like transitioning in a professional or workplace environment? Ah. And then more broadly, you, the advice that you provide to others that you're mentoring or working with on how they should handle the entire process. So we work with students often in the application process, things like identity on a resume can be a really challenging issue. But then more broadly speaking, as they're going through interview processes and things, we, we come often from a very supportive college environment to a very mm -hmm. different environment out there outside our, our walls. So I'm hoping you can give a little bit of insight on that. Yeah, of course. All right, before, um, I not only transitioned um, genders, but I transitioned careers a few years ago. When I went through my, my own transition, I was working at a very large uh, Fortune 100 company. Um, it was a very different career. I was working as an engineering program manager, very different than therapist. And I didn't change because of this, but that's a different story. So it was a very uh, corporate suit and tie type of world. Um, and it was very different than what I'm doing right now. And I worry about that a lot. I worry, you know, this environment is pretty conservative. How is the company going to respond to this? How are my coworkers going to respond? What's it going to be like? And honestly, through most of my transition, I kind of expected to, you know, like, all right, get out of here, fancy pants, at some point. And it didn't, it didn't happen. It was actually very good. Um, it was very good. It was a very good experience for me because nowadays, most of the larger companies, 
um, have come to the conclusion that diversity in the workplace seems to create um, more profits. They've equal like, hey, more diversity, more profits, we're all for it. It's not really necessarily like an ethical decision or it's not a humane decision or it's not like, oh, we love everyone. It's like, hey, this equals a better bottom line, let's do it. Um, if that trend changes, I expect you know big changes to come the other way. Um, however, uh, in most, uh, most larger companies and most industry recognize that that's a good thing to do. Um, for people who are going out seeking a job, that's a tough one. And honestly, I have gone back and forth this so many times because people have asked me in the past, all right, I've transitioned. I'm going to go for a job interview. Should I say anything? Should I hope they don't notice? Most trans people aren't super duper duper passable. Like I might walk through a crowd. Some people might read me as trans. Other people might not. I never know. Um, and I don't care. But when you're sitting in front of people at a job interview, it becomes a big question, and it's hard. Um, I don't know what the right answer is. Um, I think, honestly, I've come to the conclusion that my own personal belief is to be honest. Um, and I'll speak to my own experience. When I moved here to the Erie, PA area, um, you know, I started applying to different jobs. I didn't know if my being trans was going to help me, hurt me, or be a non-factor. So I went to a bunch of interviews that went swimmingly well. I didn't bring it up. And I didn't get offers from those jobs. And then I said, all right, I'm going to change what I do. I went to an interview, came right out in the interview, said, like, I'm transgender, just so you know. You know, I didn't say it that way. I brought it up more business-like and polite, <laughs> more interviewee, right? Not like I'm doing now. But, um, but I got that job. And I think it was me being honest because at the end of the day, what I really realized is that um, when you have two candidates with equal qualifications, they're going to hire the one that makes them feel less uncomfortable, right? So if I'm there and they don't know what to, how to deal with me, they don't know how to speak to me, if they're nervous about basically screwing up, they're not going to want to hire me so much. If I take the information to them and say, like, hey, I'm trans, I'm not really very prickly about it, I make jokes at my own expense. That's not, I'm not inviting you to make fun of me by any means, but um, I have a sense of humor about it, and I'm, you know, I just wanted to let you know. It kind of brings the temperature in the room down a bit. It makes it more comfortable for everybody. It makes it more comfortable for them. It makes it more comfortable for me. Win win. Yes. Did that answer your question? Cool. Um, hi, I'm a criminal justice uh, major here, and I would just kind of had an argument with this girl who is a CEO at a neighboring um, facility and she kind of refers to her tra transgender inmates as like it, that Ouch. kind of type of things. And she doesn't believe that um, medication or any type of surgery should be covered. And I was just kind of wondering like what your thoughts are, what, what your experiences were like as far as insurance or just bills in general, like what it was with you or like what your thoughts were as, as for inmates that maybe already passed transitioning or in the process of transitioning? That's, um, that's quite a loaded question, right? Because um, what's really, what, what I think you're asking there is, um, you know, I, I'll express my opinion in a moment. So what I hear you asking is that there's a situation where we have inmates, right? And they are in the process of transitioning and they want medical care for it because a big portion of transition is that medical portion uh, whether it means hormones whether it means uh, going for surgery uh, there are a number of different things and so as a society we take a look at it and they say like all right what do we do and it's hard because there's a huge section of the population here in the united states who think you know these are bad guys they should be punished and look at it very old school authoritarian like that I do not look at it this, that way. Um, I see this as a, a case where here's a person who's being imprisoned for, you know, obviously something they did. Um, are we going to add to their punishment by withholding medical care? And that really brings up the question, is this medical care necessary? Well, I look at it this way. Um, again, it's kind of, it speaks back to the huge amount of uh, suicidal ideation and self-harm amongst the trans population. Um, people who have trouble moving forward to transition or afraid to make it 
often harm themselves or take their own lives. So I think that speaks to the level of discomfort and suffering, mental suffering that a person is undergoing. So adding that to a person who's already, you know, being imprisoned seems a little bit cruel and unusual to me. Um, I, the trouble is I know that right now where we stand, a large portion of society doesn't see it that way. Why should the taxpayers cover the cost of this? Yada, yada, yada. But I see it as being somewhat, somewhat cruel to withhold it. Um, as for as for the CEO calling the Met, um, I'm I'm glad to go down there and do a training. <laughs> I did one at Albion once; it was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, it sounds like they need they need to step forward a little bit. Thank you. Yes. Hello, my name is Timothy. Well, I should pull that further away. <laughs> my name is Timothy. Um, my question is in regards to Canada's Bill C16. I would like to know your opinion. Do you? It's um legal re legal repercussions can be uh, enacted if someone purposely misgenders somebody? Do you believe this bill is, uh, if it promotes a better environment for people who are transitioning, do you think that it could cause resentment in the future for people who are transitioning? Oh, that's a great question. And it really speaks to what we're talking about here, those uncomfortable conversations, right? Um, so what you're speaking about is a bill that could make legal, there be legal repercussions from purposefully misgendering somebody. That's a tangled web right there, right? Um, let's break it down a little bit. Um, most, first of all, most trans people obviously prefer not to be misgendered. Um, it's an uncomfortable thing for trans people to be misgendered. Um, now you get now you're trying to divide those into when is it purposeful, when is it um, an honest mistake. Honest mistakes honestly happen all the time. Still happens to me, especially on the phone because of that whole voice therapy thing I never went through. Makes phone calls difficult. Um, as for purposely misgendering, now you're getting into um, it, it's hard to, it's hard to prove unless somebody's a real jerk about it, right? Like if I went up to you and I said like, hi, my name's Michelle, and, and you came back and you're like, how are you doing, sir? You know, and really put it that way and be like, oh, okay, that, I got a live one here. He's really trying to give me give me a hard time. And if and I said like, hey, it's actually ma'am, I actually I don't go by ma'am, just call me Michelle, and you kept using sir, I'd be like, all right, all right, it's on now, he's gonna needle me. Um, and so I'd say like, okay, that's purposeful misgendering. Am I gonna, personally, am I, do I think, all right, this is just cause to go to the police because my suffering has been so bad. Um, for me, no. I would I just walk away and say, you know, what a schmuck. But um, you know, but other people, it's more difficult. People who are just starting their transition, people who are really struggling with their mental health, people who are um, maybe experiencing a lot of anxiety just going out, um, that misgendering could be devastating. Um, so it's good, it's, first of all, it's good to recognize that. Going down the legal path to make it a crime to deliberately misgender, now we're getting into a tricky area. Um, we'll talk ideally first, right? So ideally, ideally, we will all continue working to educate as many people as possible, bring the, um, bring the instances of misgendering you know, misgendering down to where it's, you know, just at the mistake level uh, with a couple of a couple of jerks here and there, right? Um, and hopefully we will get there. If we legally enforce it, yes, I do think there'll be some kind of backlash. And, and honestly, I kind of worry about that a little bit. Um, and here's why. Um, the reason talking trans can be so uncomfortable is because it's been such a taboo topic, and so many people don't know how to talk about it right now. It becomes the most uncomfortable for everybody. Um, when you're all uncomfortable, that's what really makes me uncomfortable. If I sat here and said, do any of you have any questions, and you're all afraid to ask one, that would suck. That would suck really bad. If I went to work and nobody said like, hey, let's go out to lunch because they were too worried about screwing up and me getting mad about it, that would suck too. It would, I would be kind of like forcing my own isolation. So taking a very hard approach there, um, I, I understand the reasoning behind it. I support trying to protect people who it really might harm, 
but I could see this being maybe kind of blowing up in our collective face a little bit. And so I'm, it's something I'm leery of. So did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I had a, a, I don't know, am I, I, I had a quick question about um, misgendering. Sure. Um, so if you, uh, for example, back to the uh, concept of transgender language, if you are uh, fairly certain you know someone's gender identity, but you aren't 100% sure, uh -huh. and, but you, um, you know, you would like to refer to them in the correct uh, pronouns, how do you, you know, respectfully ask? Or how do you start that conversation without it being uncomfortable, without being, you know, impolite? That's a great question. The generally accepted thing, and it sounds awkward, right? The generally accepted thing to do is if you're not sure, it's better to ask than make the mistake. So if you came up to me, and even though I'm wearing like a kind of low cut top and the hair and all that, and you say like, what pronouns do you use? I say like, oh, I use, you know, female pronouns. I find it a little bit odd. I'm like, wow, he really doesn't have a clue, does he? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I respect the fact that you're asking more than you just saying, I don't know what to call you. Or, you know, hey, sir, ma'am, what is it? Um, in an awkward type of way. Being direct and asking a question usually isn't taken the wrong way. Um, and I, I want to say this, too. Most people going through transition or even after transition, we know what we look like, right? I've got a mirror. I could look at it. I say, like, all right, maybe you're kind of passable, maybe not. If people are a little confused, especially if I'm dressed androgynously, I'm not going to be super surprised by that, you know? Um, and a lot of other people aren't either, especially now that we have a lot of people who aren't really following the gender binary and kind of fall into that area where they might consider themselves to be uh, gender nonconforming or gender fluid. Um, just flat out asking and saying, hey, what pronouns do you use? I don't want to make a mistake here. It, I think it's always appreciated. Playing the guessing game is always, it's like this spinning the roulette wheel, right? You're never really sure where you're going to land, but just asking is okay. Good question. I, I have a question, sure. if you don't mind. Oh, my God. I'm yeah. oh, so Go sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I wonder about um, what you would say about this. So I can imagine, because I know you, um, and I know that you have a son, mm -hmm. so I can imagine some people thinking, how could she do that? She's got a kid. She's really selfish. She should have just, like, sucked it up and stayed as a male because... What's her? What's that going to do to her kid? It's going to screw her kid all up. What? And well, what you really go for that hard hitting one, yeah. you, Lane? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, I can speak to that. I do have a son. He's 11 years old. Um, he's the leg of my life. Um, love him more than anything. And I worry about that a lot. I'll be honest with you. When I went to, when I hit my, I call it my uh, expiration date. And a lot of trans people use some form of that to explain what's happening for them. When I hit my expiration date, which is the day I realize I can go no further, my brain is so sucked up with what's happening to me, everything else is kind of stopping. I'm not going to be able to continue on as I am. I was kind of forced with the decision there. Um, I could mentally break down. I could look at very lethal options. I did not want to go in that direction. Um, or... I can do what I need to do to survive and thrive and still be a very loving parent to my child, the answer seemed fairly simple to me. Um, it came down to a question of, I, people usually only transition when they absolutely have to. And I reached that point and something was going to happen and I felt that I chose the path where I could continue having a wonderful relationship with my son, where we could continue you know, growing together and where I could be there for him. And honestly, that was the most important thing to me. And honestly, because the transition process is so hard, uh, he and my wife are two of the things that really kept me going through that. I had a reason to live. I had a reason to want to not just make it through, but make it through well and be the best person I could be. It's a good question. All right. Uh, do we have any, any final questions from the audience? What's the, you want to ask the question? Yeah, I'll ask it. Um, it's Jessica says, do you think it's easier for female to male in transition? You know, that's a, I get that question a lot. It's a tough one, right? Because it's a very, we're kind of going in opposite directions often. Um, 
for male to female. I mean, a lot of the processes are the same. Um, male to female, like myself, you know, generally we have to go through, oh, sorry, strike that, not have to go through, but choose to go through a number of very painful steps. I went through um, electrolysis on my face because I, I had like very heavy beer growth and going through that really sucked. I'll be honest with you. Each one of those um, felt like a bee sting. It wasn't fun. Um, so that wasn't good. Hormone treatment, um, it felt good, but it didn't really create the level of change I would have hoped for. Um, however, because I chose to go far enough where I had what we call bottom surgery or whatever we're calling it these days, I've seen it go through sexual reassignment, gender reassignment, gender confirmation, gender affirmation, whatever we're calling it today, I went through that. And I'm honestly, I'm pretty happy with the results. Now, when you look at female to male, it's a different process. Um, it's a very different process. Yes, there's hormone therapies, and the hormone therapies for female to male um, tend to work a little better on the appearance department. Um, trans guys often, you know, can grow facial hair then, and their facial shape will change a little bit. Uh, their voice may grow a little bit deeper, um, and they can develop that upper body musculature that's more male-defining. Um, in, I'm not going to say all cases, but in many cases, in my experience, it seems that the, in terms of passability, the female to males have a little bit easier time passing. Now that said, it doesn't make the experience necessarily any easier um, because there's a lot of downsides. The, you know, the sexual reassignment surgery for female to male kind of sucks these days. They really have not put a lot of time in developing that well. So there's that co to contend with. And then there's the social aspect for both. It seems that a lot of people who transition male to female end up getting a good deal of support, you know, like, hey, I'm going into the female world. The female world has been very loving and accepting. Uh, the male world, maybe not as much. Um, again, it really depends on individual experience. Altogether, uh, both processes really bite. Um, so and if we're really going to slice it down to the nitty gritty, I think it's impossible to say who's got it easier. <laughs> Did that answer uh, Facebook Ryan's question? <laughs> Let's hope it did. So uh, to wrap up this evening, we appreciate everyone's questions. Uh, the one final question I have is, uh, do you see, and this could be for uh, any of the three on, on, the, on the panel, do you see, and I know you said for the last eight years you've seen a lot of evolution in um, you know, the treatment of transgender individuals. Do you see a day coming up where we can take the uncomfortable out of the conversation, where things become to the point where it's not, you know, it doesn't give people an uneasy feeling. It becomes more uh, mainstream, I guess. Do you mind if I take this? Go. All right. Honestly, I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope because paradigm changes like we're seeing right now are generational in nature, right? Every generation that comes along kind of builds and changes things from the generations that came before. I'm Generation X myself. I'm old. Um, I'm seeing a lot of younger faces here. And what I'm really seeing from the generations that have come after mine, uh, the millennial generation, the generation that is yet unnamed and all that, is a huge, huge, enormous shifting attitude that is far more supportive, far more open-minded, and far more accepting of things that are different than maybe they saw in the old Dick and Jane books back in my elementary school. So I see a great social evolution happening. I'm hoping it continues. We can we can have a generation come up after these who are a real bunch of, of jerks, but um, I'm hoping not. So I, I have a lot of hope that as time progresses, as more and more people know someone who's transgender or have it touch their lives uh, and go through it, that awareness will spread to the point where it's not really a big deal anymore. And honestly, I think that's what transgender people truly want. I don't want to be up here, you know, making speeches and answering questions. It'd be nice to get to the point where, like, you know, I'm just another schmo walking down the street. Oh, did you know Michelle's transgender? Oh, that's cool. And that's pretty much the end of it. We're years away from that, but um, I have hope. You know, I, hope. I, I would add that... Um it, it seems there's some parallel with the um, gay um, issue because 
I don't know. I don't. I can't really remember, but it seems like maybe not more than ten years ago, um, there was the uproar about gay marriage. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! We can't do that. The world will come to an end, and we will never see that happen. But it did happen, and it happened a whole lot faster than I would have um, anticipated that it happened. And there's more and more uh, acceptance of diversity along sexuality and gender lines. So I think that is hopeful. Um, and personally, I know quite a few people who, I, like the last time I counted, I think it was six, um, people who are in some process of the transgender process. Um, so that more and more people are, I think, being brave enough to be true to themselves and, and come out and do what they need to do to take care of themselves. I would, my caution is we can't be complacent about it because I think that there's certainly an element out there that would squash the whole shebang if they could and that we, we have to be vigilant and we have to stand up for people. We have to be allies. We have to, um, you know, stay current and know what's going on and, um, you know, advocate. So while things are getting better and I, I, I too think they will get better, I think we have to stay on top of it. All right, well, uh, let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Uh, we wanted to thank Dr. Elaine Rinfred, uh, Michelle Wolf, and Dr. Roger Walbert for their time, and thank you to all the students, faculty, staff, and community for, uh, for attending. So, uh, thanks for coming. Really. Thank you so much for coming, and thanks for all the great questions. Well, that went well. You did great. Oh, thanks. Not my first rodeo.